Thank you very much, and thank you to Claudio for the invitation to be here. Uh, this probably goes under the topic of <clears throat> now for something a little bit different. We're going to talk about acute kidney injury associated with the, in the patient with cancer. <clears throat> Let me give you the punchline here. So first of all, acute kidney injury in patients with cancer is very common. About 30% of patients who have cancer will develop acute kidney injury sometime during the course of their uh, uh, cancer. When it occurs, it has negative impacts along the care continuum. So <clears throat> chemotherapy is often start, stopped, or doses are changed, or doses that are really sublethal to the cancer are used because of the concerns about the GFR. It's associated with longer lengths of stay in the hospital when it occurs. Lower cancer remission rates, especially for hematological malignancies, the data now is emerging to be quite clear on that, and higher mortality rates. And we're going to delve into some of the etiologies. A little bit about the epidemiology. This is probably the best study in the literature. It comes from Denmark, about 37,000 incident patients over a seven-year period, showing that the one-year risk of acute kidney injury defined as more than a 50% rise in serum creatinine was nearly 18%. The five-year risk approaches about 30%. There's some recent data from a large database in Canada that actually shows in the more contemporary period in the last couple of years that that data, that incidence rate actually may be even higher. Those patients that are at the highest risk and can, can include patients with renal cell carcinoma, kidney cancer, liver cancer, and myeloma patients. Now, when AKI in hospitalized cancer patients occurs, it is associated with pretty high mortality rates, some of the highest mortality rates that I think we see with acute kidney injury. So <clears throat> baseline mortality rate of around 14% with no acute kidney injury. If the kidney function uh, falls so that hemodialysis is needed, then the rate of mortality is nearly 90%. And you can see it's graded between there. So those patients who develop acute kidney injury, who have cancer, who need hemodialysis, nearly a 90% mortality rate. We're not going to really discuss this in much detail, but <clears throat> that certainly leads to interesting and really important discussions about goals of care when patients reach that endpoint who have malignancies. Now, the etiologies in solid uh, cancer patients are really quite similar to what we see in the general population. There is an overrepresentation of some etiologies that includes obstructive causes like prostate, ovarian, and cervical cancers, as well as nephrotoxins, which we're going to talk about towards the end of the talk, as well as hypercalcemia-associated and sepsis-associated. Once again, punchline the same. When it occurs, it's associated with poor outcomes, and if it requires dialysis, very high mortality rates. Now, in hematological malignancies, really the three main uh, operative cancers are patients with myeloma, where the incidence of acute kidney injury, again, is about 30 to 40 percent at some time, leukemias and lymphomas. Here, the data, though, with hematological malignancies is interesting in that when acute kidney injury occurs, it's clearly associated with lower remission rates. And once again, when dialysis requiring acute kidney injury occurs, it's associated with very high mortality rates, is approaching 85 90%. That's within six months of the hospital stay. Now, I just want to diverge for just a second because this comes up quite often. And this is some data that we've done over the last probably decade when we've looked at this. This is acute kidney injury in patients with suspected myeloma or plasma cell dyscrasias. Here, those patients are usually picked up by having an abnormal free light chain assay, a ratio of the kappa lambda light chains. The key distinguishing feature, which I think is clinically important, and we have actually shown that the receiver operating characteristics for this are very, very high. It has a very high discriminative ratio, is to simply measure the urine albumin at the same time that you find the abnormal free light chain ratio. If the urine albumin is less than 2 grams per day, the patient most likely has cast nephropathy <coughs> where they have obstructing light chain casts that are contributing to the acute kidney injury. That leads to an interstitial inflammatory reaction, plugging of the tubules, and acute kidney injury. It can also be associated with proximal tubulopathies, the Fanconi syndrome, and electrolyte abnormalities. Those patients that have urine albumins <coughs> more than 2 grams per day typically have acute kidney injury or kidney injury due to a glomerular disease that can be a whole host of things, ranging from amyloidosis to monoclonal deposition diseases, 
to other forms of glomerular disease. Then finally, there's those patients that really don't have significant amounts of proteinuria where the acute kidney injury is completely unrelated to the paraprotein itself, maybe due to volume depletion, hypercalcemia, tumor lysis syndrome, and a whole host of other causes. But I just want to show you this because really the urine albumin in these patients can really be quite uh, useful in distinguishing the etiology of acute kidney injury. Now, when you look at acute kidney injury in patients with cancer, prerenal azotemia is by far the most common cause. The etiology, not too difficult to discern that many of these patients have very poor oral intake due to the chemotherapy-induced nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that leads to volume depletion. But other things can also cause hypoperfusion, sepsis. Patients may have other existing comorbidities like heart failure or cirrhosis, hypercalcemia causing renal vasoconstriction, and then medications that affect renal perfusion as well. Now, we're going to talk at the end about the cytokine release syndrome, which is a pre uh, coming back, I think, especially as we're seeing some new T-cell therapies that are being used for leukemias. Now, I just want to touch on some selected etiologies, the tumor lysis syndrome, talk about some chemotherapy, then finally just touch on th some things with stem cell transplants. So in tumor lysis syndrome, this is actually increasing in, in incidence, largely because some of the newer chemotherapies are incredibly cytotoxic, leading to really a higher incidence of lysis that can lead to severe consequences. It's defined as hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, and an elevated serum creatinine meeting the criteria for acute kidney injury. This is a laboratory diagnosis. This is the Cairo Bishop definition. And the risk factors for tumor lysis syndrome tend to be really pretty clear and self-evident. Large, rapidly growing tumors, so leukemias, lymphomas, especially Burkitt's or lymphoblastic leukemias, large tumors, and typically the LDH can be a really good harbinger of whether the patient will get tumor lysis syndrome. If the LDH is above 1,500, then you should really worry about that particular patient. If the chemotherapy responsive tumor, again like leukemias, they're going to lyse very quickly, and some of the newer biologics and chemotherapies are in fact very lytic. And it can also occur spontaneously, and patients can now present de novo with tumor lysis syndrome, and it's been seen with all types of chemotherapy. The pathophysiology re requires volume depletion, uric acid deposition, calcium phosphate deposition as well. Just to refresh your memory, remember when tumors lyse, they release lots of purines, adenosine and guanosine. Those get converted through the xanthine oxidase pathway down to uric acid. Uric acid is poorly soluble in the kidney. It itself actually affects glomerular filtration rates. But in other species, uric acid can be converted by a urate oxidase into a very soluble chemical called allantoin. Now, humans, unfortunately, don't have that ability, so the uric acid builds up, and that leads to precipitation and the tumor lysis syndrome leading to acute kidney injury. This pathway also really tells us really the therapeutic maneuvers. We can use allopurinol or a xanthine oxidase inhibitor to block metabolism of hypoxanthine and xanthine to the uric acid, or we can take uric acid by a recombinant uric, uh, urate oxidase, resburicase, into that more soluble mediator, allantoin. Now, just to comment about therapy, Urine alkalinization, which in the past had been sort of a cornerstone of therapy, is no longer recommended. Just to remind yourself that this, the idea behind it was that it basically favored the conversion of uric acid to a more soluble form of urate that was more soluble at a higher pH. However, the problem with urinary alkalinization is that higher alkalinization leads to an increased calcium phosphate precipitation risk. And if you're using allopurinol and you've blocked formation of uric acid, you have higher levels of hypoxanthine and xanthine. At higher urine pHs, those actually are less soluble, and you can actually get xanthine and hypoxanthine precipitation. And that leads to poorer GFRs as well. So the treatment really re responds to allopurinol, again, blocking <coughs> the, the formation of uric acid. Just to remind yourself that this really is going to prevent uric acid de novo synthesis, but high levels of uric acid when the patient presents will really not be affected by that allopurinol use. <coughs> 
Now, the new kid on the block, which is relatively new, now not so new probably, is resburicase, that recombinant uric oxidase. It's indicated for a single course of therapy in patients either at very high risk for tumor lysis syndrome or with high uric acid levels at presentation. Importantly, about 10 to 20% of patients will develop antibodies to a resburicase. That's why it's indicated for a single course of therapy. It is, in fact, very expensive. A single course of therapy costs about $4,000 per day. However, that's at the manufactured recommended dose. I can tell you we have done some studies and others have done studies that show you can get by with about a third of the recommended manufacturer dose and cut that cost from about $4,000 a day to about $1,000 a day in terms of drug uh, needed to really control the uric acid. This is data from the pivotal trial. <clears throat> what you see in the two lower lines is the uric acid level on day one when resburicase is given either with or without allopurinol, and you can see the uric acid level in this trial fell precipitously to nearly undetectable levels, less than one milligram per deciliter within a day. So very effective at lowering uric acid levels. Some cautions with resburicase. Remember, it's associated with a low risk of anaphylaxis. It's contraindication in patients with G6PD deficiency and has a risk of methemoglobinemia. The other thing is that the resburicase, when you draw the blood sample, if it's not immediately chilled, that resburicase in the blood will continue to act on the uric acid that's in that drawn sample, and the uric acid may be falsely low. So just remember, if you're drawing blood for a uric acid level in a patient that has resburicase, chill that blood specimen immediately. So the summary of prophylaxis, fluids, don't alkalinize the urine, allopurinol for prophylaxis in low to moderate risk patients, and respiricase for the high risk patients. Dialysis certainly when indicated, and CRT can be particularly useful because you really don't get that rebound in uric acid, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia as well. Now, I just want to move on and talk about the nephrotoxins. Now, this is just a sort of your trip down the nephron, showing that chemotherapeutic drugs really can affect the nephron along the whole spectrum. It can affect the glomerulus with anti-angiogenesis drugs, pomidronate interferon that can cause FSGS. You can get thrombotic microangiopathies. And then you can get various different tubulopathies, interstitial nephritis, and crystalline formation. I'm just going to show you a representative few of these drugs. Uh, and really to focus first on acute tubular necrosis. This is a list of the more common chemotherapies that cause acute tubular necrosis, cisplatin and ifosfonide being the most common. Cisplatin is a platinum compound. It's very effective for squamous cell uh, uh, solid tumors, but its major, nephro, major toxicity is nephrotoxicity. It's dose-related and really can manifest either as a tubulopathy with a Fanconi syndrome, salt wasting, magnesium wasting, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, or acute kidney injury. And that acute kidney injury is typically acute tubular necrosis, but rarely can be a thrombotic microangiopathy. The important thing is that while the nephrotoxicity can be reversible, many patients are left with chronic kidney disease and an, uh, really an incomplete recovery. Now, interestingly enough, this is data that was just published that looked at the interaction between cisplatin and getting a contrast-induced scan within the week or two before the patient got their cisplatin dose. Now, in this study, the nephrotoxicity developed in about 30% of patients were treated with cisplatin. But interestingly, if patients were exposed to contrast media within one week prior to the cisplatin, then their incidence of acute kidney injury went up two and a half fold, so it nearly was 60%. The recommendation now and <clears throat> will be adopted by the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology is that really contrast-induced scans and dosing of cisplatin should be really removed from one another by at least two to three weeks because there is this clear interaction of cumulative nephrotoxicities. The prevention of cisplatin is really uh, forced diuresis with saline. Uh, many drugs have been studied, none of which have really shown any benefit. Uh, <clears throat> for some patients, other platinums like carboplatinum or oxaloplatinum can be used. They tend to be left nephrotoxic, but they also tend to be less effective in some uh, solid tumors as well. Ifosfamide is another uh, tubular toxin. It's an alkylating agent that's, again, used for solid malignancies. Again, the major, nephroto major toxicity is nephrotoxicity. Uh, it's due to chloracetaldehyde, which is a tubular toxin, and very similar to cisplatin, can have a tubulopathy with proximal tubular dysfunction as well as causing acute kidney injury. <clears throat> 
Just like cisplatin, while it can be reversible, the effects leading to CKD can also be permanent in many patients. Prevention, unfortunately, really preventive mechanisms really, again, really rely on forced diuresis, dose reduction, and supportive care. Now, one uh, particular nephrotoxin is methotrexate that has a different mechanism of action. This is due really to crystal nephropathy. Methotrexate at very high doses can precipitate and deposit crystals within the renal tubular lumens. And this risk is increased when the tubular lumen falls, with volume depletion, or when GFRs are less than 60 mils per uh, minute, or with excessive drug dosing that's sometimes used for myeloablative chemotherapy regimens. Now, 90% of methotrexate is cleared by the kidney. The precipitation in the tubules is enhanced with an acidic pH, and the AKI tends to be non-oliguric. And the problem with AKI when you have methotrexate on board is that since 90% of the drug is cleared by the kidney, methotrexate levels rise rapidly when acute kidney injury occurs, leading to the problem that when you have high methotrexate levels now, you have the risk of really causing severe bone marrow suppression that can be irreversible, as well as neurotoxicity. So based upon this, this is the regimen now that's recommended in high-risk patients that are getting high dose or may have lower GFRs. Certainly, you want to think about urinary alkalinization in these patients, as well as pushing IV fluids, using leucovorin to block some of the metabolism of methotrexate. But if AKI occurs, then what you use is a compound called glucarbidase. Glucarbidase metabolizes methotrexate to a soluble, non-toxic derivative. It works very rapidly and really is life-saving in these patients. The other thing that should be used is high-flux high hemodialysis, which also is very effective at removing methotrexate and getting those levels down quickly, which is really important to avoid that bone marrow suppression. Last things I just want to touch on are the immune checkpoint inhibitors in acute kidney injury. These are a new group of drugs that uh, are really very powerful therapeutic agents. There's three different classes. There's the PD-1 inhibitors, the CTLA-4 inhibitors, and the PD-L1 inhibitors. These drugs all basically augment the innate body's res immune response to the cancer, but in doing so, it can lead to other autoimmune phenomena in the kidney that is manifested by the development of acute interstitial nephritis or acute granulomatous interstitial nephritis. It can lead to renal replacement therapy. The incidence is really not well described. We think it's probably 1% to 2% of patients getting these drugs. Interestingly enough, the time course is variable, but typically it requires many months of therapy. It's not something that occurs early on in their therapy. When it's recognized, steroids and withdrawal of the drug are the treatments of choice, and they're associated with really relatively rapid recovery of renal function and almost complete reversibility of the interstitial nephritis. Now, just to touch on <coughs> uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, what I just want to focus on is a particular form of acute kidney injury that's relatively rare but really uh, should be uh, known about, and that's the veno-occlusive disease or sinusoidal obstructive syndrome. This is, <clears throat> occurs in patients who are getting myeloablative allogenetic stem cell therapies. And uh, the pathophysiology is, for unclear reason, these chemotherapies lead to toxicity, especially in the liver. They cause liver failure, and they really look like the hepatorenal syndrome. That leads to acute kidney injury. And the key thing to recognize here is that there's a new drug, defibrotide, a fibrolytic agent, that actually is very powerful at preventing acute kidney injury in these patients when it occurs. Now, the last thing just to touch on is probably the newest chemotherapy or therapeutic is the CAR T-cell therapies. These are drugs or, or manufactured uh, agents that are really now uh, becoming used in leukemias. Essentially, what you do is you take T-cells from the patient. Those are genetically engineered to express a chimeric antigen receptor that recognizes the tumor, then reinfused back into the patient. Now, what happens when you readminister these T cells in very high doses, millions and millions of cells are readministered, that leads to cytokine release syndromes. That cytokine release syndrome causes profuse inflammation, causes third pacing of fluid, and causes a unique cardiomyopathy. And in total, that can lead to acute kidney injury. So something just to be aware of. So just to summarize the prognosis, the mortality rates are high, especially when dialysis is needed.
Uh, in general, dialysis decisions should be guided by the global severity and reversibility of the cancer and the acute illness. Uh, many of the patients, though, that do recover have really reasonable quality of life. So these discussions are very difficult. They're hard to predict often and really require individualization uh, to make those decisions wisely. So thank you very much.